Today we begin our discussion of the fishes. A nice picture of a lionfish, an invasive species, if you see it in Atlantic waters. <clears throat> We're going to start by looking at phylum chordata. And phylum chordata is a little bit more broad than just the fish. Phylum chordata includes every animal that has what is called a chord or notochord. Uh, there's some other characteristics that link them together. We'll see all of those. Uh, this is a nice intro video that gets you kind of caught up with where we need to be to discuss these guys. You're a mammalian, amniotic, tetrapodal, sarcophagian, osteichthyan, mathostomal vertebral cranial chordate. Yeah, it's a mouthful. And in order to understand what it means, you're going to have to understand the most complex group of animals on Earth and what it takes to get from this to this. <laughs> Phylum chordata accounts for all 52,000 species of vertebrates on Earth and several thousand species of invertebrates. Together, they range from tiny, brainless filter feeders all the way up to Scarlett Johansson. Now, you know by now that when we talk about classifying animals, we're really talking about their shared ancestry. Each new branch on this tree marking an important new evolutionary milestone. And just like with tissue layers and segmentation in simpler animals, there are traits we can look for to track the evolution of chordates. By the time all of those traits appear in one organism, we'll have arrived at the most complex class within the most complex phylum, the mammals. But first, let's start with the fundamentals. We've talked before about synapomorphic traits, traits that set a group of animals apart from its ancestors and from other groups that came from the same ancestors. Chordates share four synapomorphies that make us who we are. Each of them is present at some point in every chordate's life cycle. How about a volunteer to demonstrate these traits? Ah, I see that the lancelets are raising their mouth parts. The lancelets, also known as cephalochordata, literally head cords, are one of the three subphyla of chordates. And unlike almost all other chordates, these tiny, brainless invertebrate filter feeders retain all four of these characteristics for their entire lives. You probably already know where most of these traits are going to appear, since the phylum is named after it, the spinal cord, or at least something that resembles the spinal cord. First, there's the notochord, a structure made of cartilage that runs between an animal's digestive tube and its nerve cord. In most vertebrates, a skeleton develops around the notochord and allows the muscles to detach. In humans, the notochord is reduced to the discs of cartilage that we have between our vertebra. Second, we have the nerve cord itself, called the dorsal hollow nerve cord, a tube made of nerve fibers that develops into the central nervous system. This is what makes chordates different from other animal phyla, which have solid ventral nerve cords, meaning they run along the front or stomach side. And third, all chordates have pharyngeal slits, in invertebrates like the lancelet here, they function as filters for feeding. In fish and other aquatic animals, they're gill slits. And in land dwelling invertebrates like us, they disappear before we're born. But that tissue develops into areas around our jaws, ears, and other structures in the head and neck. And finally, we can't forget our fourth synapomorphy, the post-anal tail, which is exactly what it sounds like. It helps propel aquatic animals through the water, makes our dog look happy when she wags it. And in humans, it shrinks during embryonic development into what is known as the coccyx, or tailbone trait. And trust me, when it comes to tail placement, post-anal is the way to go. These four traits all began to appear during the Cambrian explosion more than 500 million years ago, and today they're shared by members of all three chordate subphyla, even if the animals in those subphyla look pretty much nothing like each other. For instance, our new friends here in Cephalochordata are the oldest living subphylum, but you can't forget the other invertebrate group of chordates the urochordata, <coughs> literally tail cords. There are over 2,000 species here, including sea sports, and if you're confused about why this ended up in a phylum with us, it's because they have tadpole-like larvae with all four chordate characteristics. The adults, which actually have a highly developed internal structure with a heart and other organs, retain the pharyngeal slits, but all the other chordate features disappear or reform into other structures. The third and last and most complex subphylum is the vertebrata and has the most species in it because its members have a hard backbone which has allowed for an explosion in diversity from tiny minnows to the great blue whale. You can see how fantastic this diversity really is when you break down vertebrata into its many 
many classes from slimy sea snaky things to us warm and fuzzy mammals. And as these classes become more complex, you can identify the traits they each developed that gave them an evolutionary edge over the ones that came before. For example, how's this for an awesome trait? A brain. Vertebrates with a head that contains sensory organs and a brain are called craniates. They also always have a heart with at least two chambers. So since this is science, you gotta have to know that there's gonna be exceptions for every rule that you're gonna have to remember. And the exception in this case is the myxony, or hagfish, the only vertebrate class that has no vertebra, but is classified with us because it has a skull. This snake-like creature swims by using segmented muscles to exert force against its notochord. Whatever hagfish. Closely related to it is the class Petromyzontida, otherwise known as lampreys, the oldest living lineage of vertebrates. Now these have a backbone made of cartilage, and maybe even more important, a more complex nervous system. With the advent of a backbone, we see vertebrates getting larger, developing more complex skeletons, and becoming more effective at catching food and avoiding predators. But did you notice anything missing? Lampreys and other early vertebrates are agnathans, literally no jaws, and if you want to be able to chew food, it really helps to have a jaw and teeth. Most scientists think that the jaw evolved from structures that supported the first two pharyngeal slits near the mouth. And teeth? Well, the current theory is that they evolved from sharp scales on the face. Now the stones, or jaw mouths, arrived on the scene 470 million years ago, and one of the oldest and most successful groups of Nath stones that have survived to the present day are the class Chondrichthys, the cartilage fish. You know them as the sharks and skates and rays, and as their name says, their skeleton is made up mostly of cartilage. But they show the beginnings of a calcified skeleton. Chondrichthys haven't changed much over the past 300 million years or so, and their success stems from the paired fins that allow for efficient swimming, and those jaws for fighting off delicious hunks of flesh. If we're going to eventually get to the mammals, we need bones, and we find those with the evolution of fish. Meet Osteichthys, which technically means the bony fish. Unlike cartilaginous fish, members of this group have a mineralized endoskeleton. Now, Osteichthys is sometimes considered a superclass because it includes a whole slew of diverse classes that descended from it. There's actually some controversy among taxonomists about what to call it. The main thing to know is that the majority of all vertebrates fall under Osteichthys, and that includes you. It's broken up into two main groups, which themselves include a bunch of classes. The first is the Actinopterygy, or ray-finned fishes, and with 27,000 species, pretty much every fish you've ever heard of is in this group. Ray-finned fishes evolved in fresh water, spread out into the oceans, and some, eventually, of them came back to fresh water. In the second group, things started to get really strange and interesting. These are the lobe-finned fishes, or the sarcopterygy. A name derived from bones surrounded by muscle found in their pectoral and pelvic fins, and that sounds like something that could be used for walking. Lobe fins include the coelacanths, which consist of one living species, lung fish, which gulp air into their lungs, and tetrapods, which have adapted to land with four limbs. This is weird, right? Even though land animals clearly are not fish, since tetrapods evolved from bony fish, they are filed under this group. These taxonomists, man, I want to party with them sometimes. But first... <laughs> you're a fisherman off the coast of South Africa in the western Indian Ocean about 75 years ago. Let's just put that in your brain. Hold them up to it. And you've just pulled up a fish that no one has ever seen. Not only that, you caught a fish that was thought to have become extinct 75 million years ago. This is exactly what happened in 1938 when Captain Hendrik Goosen hauled up a coelacanth, and it has mystified scientists ever since. A second population has since been identified near Indonesia in 1999, but the deep sea creatures remain extremely rare. The coelacanth fascinates scientists because of its paired lobe fins. They extend from the body like legs and move in an alternating pattern. In other words, they move more like a horse than like a fish. And in fact, those paired fins are supported by the very same bones that we have in our arms and legs. The coelacanth also has a hinge joint in the skull, so it can widen its mouth to eat large prey, as well as thick scales that don't exist on any living fish. It's not good eating, but why would you want to eat what's essentially a living fossil? All right, now we're talking about tetrapods, which of course means four feet, and getting the... All right, we're going to skip that, because now that gets into some depth that we'll be covering in our later units. But let's talk about phylum chordata. All right, so kind of summarizing some of the things that you saw in the video... Uh, phylum chordata, there's a sample diagram of one up at the top of the page, are bilateral organisms. So again, we said that uh, sea stars 
uh, Echinodermata, Phylum Echinodermata, and all of the relatives of the sea star are obligate bilateral organisms. They start off as bilateral organisms and then they grow into uh, radial, pentaradial organisms. <clears throat> they all have notochords, a rod of cartilage that forms parts of the spine, the cartilage in between our backbones and us, uh, and some, it is the only support structure that runs down the back of the animal. They have a dorsal neural tube, so a spinal cord, basically, uh, that's what we have. Uh, you can see that labeled as number three in the image, and that is different from what we saw, if you remember back in our annelids, they actually have a nerve that runs down the dorsal and ventral side of their body. Pharyngeal slits. What becomes gills in many fish uh, becomes uh, either filter feeding organisms in some of the chordates, or we think jaws in humans and other mammals. Uh, many other vertebrates. Post-anal tail. That just means basically that the tail is found behind the anus. It's posterior to the location of the anus, number four in the diagram. <clears throat> we also have something called an endostyle, wasn't mentioned in that video. It is a ventral groove, so a groove that runs along the ventral side of the body of a chordate. Again, many of these features disappear in later development of the organism. Uh, some of them disappear completely and only exist for a short while. Some of them become other more complex structures as the organism grows and develops. So phylum chordata, let's summarize what we know about the members of this group. First, there's three groups of chordates. The urochordates, name means tail cord. That includes the tunicates or the sea squirts. You can see some nice pictures of those little dudes up there that look nothing like us, but they are still in the same phylum as us. They are sessile, Again, that means they don't move around during their adult life cycle. Filter feeders. They have motile larvae. So during their juvenile stage, when they're larvae, they swim around. And kind of strangely, their larva looks maybe sort of fish-like. Um, they have a notochord that extends down into their tail. The next group, the cephalochordates, or the lancelets. That's the common name. Uh, the cephalochordates means... Uh, head cord. They have no brain, but they do have a head and some sensory organs. And then lastly, the craniates. This is the group we belong to. To be a craniate, you have to have a skull. Uh, we saw that there's one exception to that, and otherwise uh, we are all craniates if we have a skull. All right, selps. These are the asexually reproducing stage of some tunicates. So here are some pictures of selps. Again, remember, these guys are in the same phylum as us. Kind of strange to think that you are related to these guys more closely than any other organism we've covered in this class. And that brings us, lastly, to subphylum vertebrata. So the vertebrates, that's where we're headed in future lessons, is any chordate, specifically a craniate, with a backbone. And that kind of makes sense since the name is vertebrata, they have vertebrae. The backbone surrounds the spinal cords, it gives, gives them some protection to that nerve cord that runs down the dorsal side of the body. It provides primary axial support, what that means is the body can move around that skeletal structure. There's something for the muscles to push off of. Clearly there has to be a skull for you to be a craniate. We've already said that. So something that protects the brain and the nerve organs in the front part of the body, the interior part of the body. Uh, this group, vertebrata, includes fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds. We're not going to cover all of them in this unit. We're going to cover fish. Then we have a unit where we look at amphibians, reptiles, birds, and finally we will cover mammals in this class. There are about 64,000 species in subphylum vertebrata. So it's a very diverse group. 4% of all animals are vertebrates. So just to give you a rough idea of what we're talking about in terms of all animals. These are the classes. Agnatha, jawless fishes, convertthes, cartilaginous fishes, 
osteichthyes, the bony fishes, and then later on we'll get into amphibia, reptilia, aves, and mammalia.